Um, I think actually you can take a, a good landscape photo with whatever camera you have in your pocket. It depends on a lot more than just equipment. Um, and actually, I, I, I often say to my students that actually buying more camera equipment is the last thing you should do. Spanning the globe to bring great photographers and their experience directly to you. It's 8 p.m. in Japan, 1 p.m. in Spain, and 12 noon in our guest's home in Devon, England. That means it's time for the Camera Cafe Show, brought to you by professional photographer Tom Jacob and his faithful sidekick, photography enthusiast Dave Payne. That's me. Tom, you want to uh, welcome our special guest and get things going? Uh, thank you, my, my sidekick, but you're more than that, Dave. You're, you're, you're a very good uh, photographer. So uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, today we have another special episode with Gary Holpin. For people uh, at home, if you don't know Gary, he's from the UK, from Devon. He's a fantastic uh, landscape photographer. He also does some commercial work. He also sometimes throws a drone into the air to get even more better shots. He won numerous awards in the UK. He published some books. We'll get onto that later. And he also takes care of two cats so we don't keep things up waiting. And, and we get over to Gary, you're there. Hi. Hi, guys. Hey, Gary. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Just to start easy, uh, Gary, tell us a bit about your photography journey. Um, I mean, how you started, where it went to, and, and including why you walked 630 miles of the southwest coastal part in the UK, not once, but two times. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think, um, like a lot of people, mo most of my photography for many, many years was just having a, a, a compact camera in my pocket and taking photos, very bad photos of uh, parties and uh, family and things like that. And then um, about uh, 15 years ago, um, I moved to a beautiful part of uh, England, um, uh, Devon in the southwest of England. And so uh, one day I, I put on some walking boots and um, I decided uh, to walk uh, all 630 miles of the Southwest Coast Path, um, which is a, a national trail that goes around the whole coastline um, of Southwest England. Um, and basically, I did that um, in weekends over a couple of years. And I took lots of very bad shots of our beautiful scenery. Uh, and when I finished, I was so disappointed that those photos didn't really do justice to um, the, the, the scenery we have here that I decided I was going to walk it again. Um, and this time I was going to teach myself how to take a decent photo and wind forward uh, 15 years and um, I, know, I know do it as a living. So, um, you know, walking the uh, the coast of uh, the southwest has, has definitely changed my, my my life for the better. It's a, it's a be beautiful region there. Uh, I, I've been once or twice. I didn't walk, I think, any mile of the southwest coastal path, but uh, it's it's just beautiful there. I mean, I wouldn't know where to start to make any pictures is everywhere you look when you are there it's worthy of of a shot so i guess you have your favorite places to go uh yes um in fact, I, don't, I don't tend to travel too far because um even though i've been living in in devon for sort of 15 20 years now um i still feel like i'm getting to know it and, and i'm still finding new locations that um are very photogenic gary okay. quick question what is it about a particular scene that grabs your attention and makes it as you say photogenic um it's actually quite a difficult question to answer now these days after taking i don't know how many photos i've taken um over over the last sort of 15 years but now i almost immediately see in my mind's eye whether a photo works or not so it's almost become automatic and so therefore it's quite hard to describe i think what what it is that makes it a good scene but I guess, I, I guess, to be honest, it's the same thing that would make you stand there and go, wow, that's a nice view. But actually uh, seeing a nice view and being able to capture a good photo of it, um, that's, uh, that's the journey that I've been on the, the, last, uh, the last 10, 15 years. Yes, it's, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a thing with most people starting out in, in landscape photography that you see, you see really what you want to make the shot of. You make the shot, you look at it, and then you say, nah, it's not what I saw. So 
Absolutely. And, and that's actually, um, it's, it's one of the things I, I teach on my training courses, actually, is there's a very good reason for that. It's because, you know, we see the world with our amazing binocular vision in three dimensions. Um, and then we try and make a two dimensional photo out of it. And it loses a lot in translation. Um, and that's how things like composition rules uh, start to help to create a two dimensional image, which has enough interest um, to work as a photograph of that of, of that three dimensional scene, if that makes sense. Yeah, that no, make, makes makes sense. I, I understand completely. Yeah. So t tell us a bit, uh, Gary, about for the listeners, what are the basic types of equipment required to successfully shoot a uh, landscape? Um, I think actually you can take a, a good landscape photo with whatever camera you have in your pocket. It depends on a lot more than just equipment. Um, and actually, I, I, I often say to my students that actually buying more camera equipment is the last thing you should do. You should basically learn how to use what you've got first and only spend money on equipment when you find that your current uh, camera equipment can't do something that you really want to do. No, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I agree. What kind uh, of camera you're shooting with, Gary? So, so I I shoot with a, a Sony uh, Sony mirrorless uh, full frame camera. Um, I, well, I've got a, a Sony um, A seven R four and a Sony A seven R three for those who know their cameras. Um, and I've I've always, I've actually only, always shot with uh, mirrorless because I find that they have some technical advantages over DSLRs. Um, but actually, the, the reason I started shooting Sony mirrorless was that um, when I started walking the coast path the second time, I, I thought, right, I need to I need to buy a proper camera if I'm going to start taking decent landscape photos. And I bought a, an entry level DSLR, a Canon DSLR. But the problem was it was like a brick. Um, <laughs> and putting, putting it around my neck and trying to walk 20 miles of the coast path, I found that I got bruises. <laughs> <laughs> and so all, all that happened was I put it in my backpack and then didn't use it. So um, I bought uh, one of the early um, Sony mirrorless uh, uh, crop sensor cameras that was significantly smaller and lighter um, than most DSLRs um, at the time. Um, and it meant that I could put it around my neck and comfortably walk 20 miles without it giving me bruises. Um, so, so that's kind of how I got into into Sony mirrorless, and I've kind of stuck with them um, on the on their journey. And most your 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 lens is fixed focal length, or, or I guess you you have zooms also longer ones because you do also commercial work, so you need to be closer. Or... Yeah, because I end up for my landscape photography, you know, walking up hills and walking ten miles on the moorland. Um, actually, my normal lenses are. Uh, three um, zoom lenses so i've got a 14 to 24 uh, millimeters a 24 to 70 uh, zoom and a 70 to 200 and i find that those three cover all of the focal lengths that i really need um, for my landscape photography um, so i do i do have a couple of primes but the problem with primes is um, obviously if i if i've walked 10 miles and i need a different lens i can't just go back to the car and get one so I tend to carry those three uh, zoom lenses, which cover all of the focal lengths that I that I tend to use. Yeah, because because someone uh, a listener he asked the question, what length of lens you 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 prefer? Because he was referring that Canon brings out, I think it's a twelve millimeter one point two lens. But I think in, in in landscape, the fast lens is not really an issue. I mean, it will be a very good lens because it will be one point two, and it's more to do that you have a good quality lens because you will stop it down anyway. No, the the lens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I I do think that one thing to spend money on if you can afford it is the best quality glass, uh, basically. Mm -hmm. Because um, I remember when I was starting out, I kind of bought some mediocre lenses. Um, and I soon found that the quality wasn't very good and ended up selling them and buying the best quality lenses. So I have I have the Sony GM range, the sort of master uh, pro level mm -hmm. glass. Yeah. Um, and I hope to not have to change them for quite a long time because they're kind of about the best you can get. Um, I, I, I do have at least one prime, um, but they tend to be for specific things. So I, I do have a, a prime that I use for astrophotography. Oh, um, and that's because it's got a maximum aperture of f1.4. And so, but so you're right. Normally, for landscapes, actually having a, a wide 
um, maximum aperture is not quite so important. Um, but for specific things like astro, um, it is important. So that's why I've got a specific prime when I do that kind of shooting. Okay. It's interesting yeah. listening to your lens selection. There's another landscape photographer uh, that I follow, Andy Mumford. And in his YouTube interviews, he has almost identically the same layout lens-wise as you do. He shoots Fujifilm, but okay. he, does this, he does the same thing. He's got like a, a very wide angle to mid-20s, 20 to 80, and then 80 to 200. He can travel light. He's yep. got any situation pretty much covered depending on his foreground or background and what he's got to manipulate. And he goes up into the mountains way high and does some gorgeous shots, but it's your methodology almost to a T. That's fascinating. Is that a... Uh is that a common trait for landscape photography to do it that way, Gary? You know what? I don't know, actually. Um, it's not something I've really paid attention to, but I, I will say that I, I've got I've got to that situation purely by trial and error. You know, I've had various lenses over over the years, and I found that, that those three cover almost all eventualities when I'm out and about. Now, it, it, they're not particularly light, you know, uh, especially the 7200 um, Sony uh, GM lens is a pretty heavy lens. Um, and if I if I get to walk up a very steep hill and I don't think I need it, I will leave it behind occasionally. Uh, and for things like, you know, if I want to do a moon a shot of the moon, then going to 200 millimeters isn't enough. But actually, those three do cover almost everything. And I've got there just by trial and error. Wow, that's that's fascinating. With those big lenses, then a tripod is a necessity or something nice to have in your mind? Depends what sort of photography you do. But, landscape. Well, even in terms of landscape, if you only ever go out on nice, bright, sunny days, um, then you don't necessarily need a tripod. But since the best landscape photography is when the, often when the light is low, then a tripod is, a, is a, an absolute must. And also, if you like to do long exposure photography, as I do, um, then you know my tripod is always attached to my rucksack. Makes perfect sense. I, I think wow. I think Dave now he talks about long. Somebody I think also they ask when is the best time to use long exposures. When is the best time? Um, I'm not well, quite I, sure I what they're referring to. Maybe seascapes or, or clouds. I think these ones you want to stick <laughs> out, or I suppose this is the question. Yeah. yeah. So um, the best situation is when you've got water. Um, so it could be the sea, um, it could be a waterfall, it could be um, a tumbling river. Uh, and that's the usual use of longer exposures is to either slightly blur the movement of water like you might do with a waterfall or to completely flatten a sea so you don't see any waves at all. Um, but I, I do occasionally use it for clouds, but clouds move a lot slower and so you end up having to use... Um, very long exposures of, of minutes but occasionally that can be quite useful because it can actually give you lead-in lines to your photo that that don't exist when you look at it with your eye and of course we're talking about nd filters because if not you cannot let it open but generally although um as I, I i teach my my students um if you want to start getting into long exposure photography without spending money on filters at first then go to the beach um at dusk mm -hmm. um or at dawn when the light levels are low um, and essentially if you close your aperture right down, you should be able to get to um, shutter speeds of anything up to, um, you know, half a second, two seconds, three seconds and start blurring water um, even without any um, ND filters. Yeah. I, for I forgot you're from the UK. I mean, we cannot do this in Spain. So you, you have Gary, to weather. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, something you just said, um, for some of our listeners, I'm sure they've heard the expression, stop your aperture down. But what does that mean? Is it the lower number apertures, the higher number apertures? Can you enlighten them a little? Um, stopping it down. It's not, it's not an expression that I use. What I understand it to mean is to, is to make your aperture smaller. So the, the difference between one aperture and the next is, is is called a stop. 
So it's right. a stop of light, it's a halving or a doubling of the amount of light. But generally that phrase to me means that you're closing down your aperture, you're letting in less light. So going toward like an F16 or something. Yeah, so so one I'm mean, obviously one of the confusions in in photography that a lot of my students find is the confusion about a, a small f number being a large aperture and a large f number being a small aperture. It's just <laughs> one of those annoying one of those annoying things that just is unhelpful when you're starting out in photography. <laughs> so now now you're talking about about students and things, but what what would be three or four important tips you can you can offer uh, people just starting out in landscape photography, Gary? Okay, so I think the most important thing to learn, and you can do this whatever camera you've got, and you don't have to spend any money at all on equipment, is to learn about composition. I, I think that is the the most important thing that you can do, is to learn a few of the basic rules of composition um, and start following them. So I would say the most important ones being, what is your focal point? Does your photo have a focal point? using the rule of thirds in terms of where you put the key elements of your uh, of your photo so maybe where you put the horizon where you where you put the main subject to the focal point um and looking for lead in lines is is a very powerful one in photography so finding something like a road or a fence um or even ripples in the sand that can help to lead the viewer's eye um into the landscape photo and basically make it look more interesting to look at yeah, um so that's that's the first one is to learn about composition the next one is to not go out taking photos on the nicest days <laughs> i think when i first started out i would only go walking on nice blue sky sunny days but actually they're the most boring days for taking landscape photos so um, unfortunately you have to go out on the the days when it's showery and you might get a rainbow or when you've got um, stormy clouds in the sky that make the sky, the sky look more interesting. Um, essentially weather gives drama. Um, mm -hmm. So don't go out on nice days. Um, and the third one would probably be actually, uh, and this is, this is largely how I learned actually, which is to find a photographer whose work that you like, find a photo of theirs that you like and try and understand how they took it. Um, and, and that really helped me a lot. Um, I, I particularly liked um, photographers who were doing long exposures. Um, and so I basically you know, taught myself how to do long exposure photography. So I, I think looking at other people's work and getting inspired by it, by it and learning how they, how they took it is, is a good way to improve. Yeah, so this is also a good way why we are on, on, on Twitter or social media. So it's... Uh, it's interesting for me also it's always interesting to to help new people and to get them make better shots so in in your in in all the workshops you did gary mm. you know what what are some of the key aspects of of problems your students most struggle with yeah i think i mean i think there are a number of things which um most people struggle with and one of the good things uh, about the fact that i'm self taught is that i've been through all these struggles myself you know I, I i found the same confusions when i started out so i think one of the things that students struggle with to start with is that cameras modern cameras have far too many buttons <laughs> dials and menu options you know there's literally hundreds of menu items um, and so actually one of the things that I, I i try and do in my courses is to teach students the ones that are important there are actually only, if you're doing one genre of photography, like landscape photography, there's there are probably only about 10 settings that you really need to understand. Um, and that means there's 190 or something that you generally don't need to know about. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing which a lot of students struggle with at first. Um, and the other one is how to get off automatic, understanding how to move on to um, the semi-manual modes like um, aperture priority and shutter priority and obviously ultimately moving on to onto manual and and it is tricky it does take a bit of effort to get your head around it but it obviously it's the it's the key to unlocking creativity in all in all genres of photography um uh, as well as in landscape photography so so it's something that i i tend to spend a lot of time in my workshops on is getting people comfortable with shooting on manual 
So how how long did it take your your workshop? Is is it a weekend or? Uh, yes, yeah, that, that they they tend to be they tend to be weekend workshops. So, and and I would say it probably takes a good two or three hours of working on um, understanding what aperture is all about, what shutter speed is all about, and ISO um, until people are reasonably comfortable with knowing what they're doing on manual. Um, e even if then when we go out and do some shooting that they feel more comfortable using um, aperture priority maybe, but I think it's important for people to understand the basics of how to shoot on manual. But not yeah. an easy task, yeah? just in there. No, it's it's not an easy task, but I don't, I don't think I've failed. I've been, I've been doing courses now for about uh, six years, I think, and I don't think I've failed yet with a student not understanding it. <laughs> Even if maybe they weren't, you know, terribly comfortable just after one weekend with, with using it all the time, um, I think, you know, after a few hours, um, I can get most people to grasp what it's all about. Excellent, Gary. Another another listener wrote in a question that I found interesting. Uh, in my own efforts to begin to try to shoot landscape after seeing your work, this question it, it could come from me, but a listener brought it in. Where is the ideal focus point in a landscape image? That is a really good question, actually, and it, and it does come up occasionally from my students, and I'm, I'm very glad when it does, because the answer is relatively simple, actually. Uh, I assume the question means where to focus. Is that, is that right, Dave? Yeah. Yeah, where to focus. So um, it, it depends. <laughs> if you have a, a definite focal point, so if you imagine that you've got a, a, a photo of a seascape um, with a um, with a, a lighthouse in it, for example, clearly the photo is going to be ruined if the main focal point, i.e. the lighthouse, is out of focus. So one approach is focus on the lighthouse, because actually if that's in focus, it doesn't matter quite so much about the rest of the scene. If there isn't a, a definite focal point, if it's just a, a, a seascape with, you know, beach and sea and cliffs and mountains in the distance, for example, then um, the best thing to do is to, it's a rule of thumb, but to focus around a third into the frame. Now, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to define that exactly. It's, it's like um, the hyperfocal but, distance, no? Well, yeah, I mean, without getting into hyperfocal distance, focusing a third into the frame gives you roughly uh, the hyperfocal distance and it's far easier to understand. So if you imagine you're standing on a cliff top and you've got some, um, you've got the cliffs in front of you and you've got a beach below you and you've got some mountains in the distance, the answer is don't focus right at your feet and don't focus on the mountains in the distance. Focus maybe on the beach below. So, you know, around a third into the into the frame. And as long as you're using uh, an aperture, which gives you a fairly uh, deep depth of field. So in landscape, I usually say start about F11, F13. Then if you focus around a third into the frame, then most of your image will be um, acceptably in focus. Does that make Let sense? Me, it makes perfect sense. Let me paraphrase what you just said. You mentioned earlier the rule of thirds, and I know yeah. like in my camera, in the EVF, I have the option, and I have it on all the time, Good. to put those grid lines in there so yeah. I could focus on the lower horizontal rule of thirds line or maybe the upper one. Is that oh. a possibility? That there's a, maybe there's a slight confusion here between, okay, so there's the rule of thirds, which which um cuts your frame up into two lines horizontally and two line vertically two lines vertically when i'm talking about focusing a third into the frame i'm thinking about the other dimension so i'm thinking about between you and the distant horizon so yeah. so you know if you're if you're so forget your two-dimensional rule of thirds grid but actually if you're looking into the distance in towards infinity then i'm talking about focusing about a third from where you're standing towards the distant mountains. No, that makes perfect sense. Something that I tried just two weeks ago was thinking about foreground, midground, and background. I looked at my scene through the EVF. Then I looked at it at around F5.6. Then yep. I looked at the, without moving the camera, then I looked at it at F14. I left it at F14 and came back and focused on what was clear 
in the F5.6. I, w- I was trying to use depth of field as a, yeah. as a helper. Does that make sense in landscape? Um, in landscape, depth of field is normally less of an issue. So uh, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, um, I normally say to my students, shoot about F11, F13. The reason for that is that it's a small enough aperture to give you a deep depth of field, but it's not so small that it cuts out too much light. And actually, unless you've got something very close to you, like, you know, imagine you had a, a nice flowering tree very close to you, then you start to get into issues. But if you've just got a, a big panoramic landscape, if you're on F11, F13, and you focus about a third into the frame, you don't really get any issues with areas of the photo being out of focus. You only start to get into issues if you maybe you're taking a picture of you know a person standing on a cliff with a, a, a seascape behind them. In, uh, did that answer your question? Does yeah, that answer no, your question? You, you, it did real well. I mean, it's helpful because one of the things that becomes apparent is there's a lot more to creating a landscape photo than just point and shoot. I mean, just listening to you in the short time we've been together today, it's really fascinating. I mean, and you have to think about it differently. For me, being a black and white shooter, primarily, you know, I Hmm. think about, can you do landscapes in black and white? Will they... I look for texture and, of course, leading lines and tonal changes. Like Ansel Adams talks, of, you know, about his zone or his tonal system. Does that work in landscape photography? Uh, absolutely does. Uh, um, I think some of my favorite photos are actually black and white. Uh, and actually, it's quite a good way of dealing with Difficult light. So I said to you that actually the worst times to do landscape photography are bright, sunny days. Actually, when you've got strong contrast, as you do on a bright, sunny day, sometimes black and white can work really well because actually you get rid of the bright blue sky by turning it into a mono shot. And then you start to see the textures and the shapes more. Um, So actually, yes, black and white is a really useful option. Um, for landscape photography, especially in certain types of light. Very helpful. Now, I think I know what I'm doing this weekend. (laughs) (laughs) Gary, one last question that we'd like to bring today's episode to the finish line with. For those who are into landscape photography now, what is one thing you'd recommend they should start doing and one thing they should stop doing and why? Um, one thing you should they should definitely start doing, if they haven't already, is to go out and watch a sunrise. And the reasons why are, firstly, to start to understand how light changes um, and how light affects the landscape. But also, even if they don't even get a decent shot of it, landscape photography is great because it makes you get out there and watch a sunrise. And many, many people don't do that. So even if you don't get the shot, go and watch a sunrise just because it's a beautiful thing to see. Okay. And one thing they should stop doing? Um, (laughs) You might say, I would say this because I, I do photography training, but I would say if you want to improve your camera equipment, um, sorry, if you want to improve your landscape photography, go and learn how to use your current camera and stop thinking that the answer is to buy another camera or more equipment. Um, Because I I did that, um, and it never really helped my photography. Um, What helped my photography was to learn, um, was to go on a course and learn how to take a decent photo. Uh, Obviously, if you're in Devon, you can come to me, um, but I would say go go and learn from a landscape photographer how to use your current camera properly, um, and stop just buying camera equipment to make to, to uh, think that that's going to make your photography better. Excellent. How how are the scones in Devon? Before <laughs> the scones. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as as I think you know, Tom, I do like a good scone. Well, the first debate is whether it's scone or scone. That's that's yeah. that's one debate. And, and I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's also a debate um, on whether you have it the Devon way or the Cornish way. So um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass myself now because I can't remember which way around it is. 
Um, but one, <laughs> one, one, one of the counties say that the best way to have a, have a scone is to have the cream first with the jam on top. And the other county says that you have the, uh, have it the other way around. So, um, if you ever come to the Southwest of England, you know, which county you're in by whether the jam or the cream is on the scone first. No, I, w- I will trust your opinion when I'm there. I'm going to go. I'm going to go and check which way around it is um, because I really should know. But in, in my defence, I don't actually like cream, so I only have jam. So sounds good. Yeah. In your weekend photography classes that I'm going to sign up for and fly from Japan, there you provide <laughs> scones, right? <laughs> It's funny you should say that, but actually, um, the the venue where we hold the courses, um, uh, the the owner does occasionally drop in on the Sunday afternoon, having baked some scones scones for us. So yes, I can't, it can't be guaranteed, it can't be guaranteed, but occasionally homemade scones are are, are on the uh, are on the menu. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Gary, this has been a lot of fun and extremely educational. Anything in general you'd like to add? for our listeners to hear and think about when it comes to landscape photography? I think one of the, one of the things which is quite hard to grasp and only comes with practice, but is very important is looking for simplicity. So one of the main issues with, um, with landscape photography is the world around us is very cluttered and very, very uh, complex. And actually what I spend a lot of my time doing is looking for uh, simplicity. So looking for simple compos- compositions, which make it clear where you want where you want the viewer to look. Um, and actually, one of the reasons why I one of the reasons why I use uh, long exposures quite a lot is if you imagine uh, a seascape with uh, maybe a pier going out into the sea. Obviously, on the sea you've got waves, and if you're looking at that photo, if it's taken with a fast shutter speed, the eye is drawn to the waves and not necessarily to the pier, which was meant to be your main subject. And so the reason why I use long exposure photography quite a lot is that by doing, say, 30 second exposure, you flatten the sea completely, and therefore the eye is no longer drawn by the detail of the waves, and you simplify the scene in such a way that it's more obvious that you want the viewer to look at the pier. So I think teaching your eye to look for simplicity in the landscape um, is a very important skill that only really comes with practice. Take a lot of photos and see what works, and you'll usually find the simpler compositions are the ones that work. Wonderful. Dave, he's explaining it too well. I think even I am going to sign up for the workshop. <laughs> okay. That, My job that, is done. That's fine. You bring some of that delicious Spanish ham. He provides the scones. I've got the matcha tea, and we have a sold out course immediately. Of course. <laughs> oh, well, you, you should, guys, you, sh- you should come soon because it will soon be bluebell season here with, uh, and uh, I know some wonderful locations where there'll be a, a carpet of bluebells beneath um, trees with new green leaves on where we can sit and have our picnic um, of oh. Spanish ham, um, Japanese green tea uh, and scones. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the pictures already. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a winner. Uh, oh, we got to take pictures while we're out there eating. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward <laughs> to the pictures. Also, <laughs> <laughs> the menu sounds great though. <laughs> Gary, we we really appreciate your time and want to thank you for sharing your your wisdom and your wonderful views with our listeners today. Great job. Absolute, thank you. Absolutely, my absolutely my pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. So there we go. That was our first podcast about landscape photography. And we thank Gary very much for for being so helpful. And I'm sure many of our listeners have new insights and maybe find a new way to improve their landscape photography. And I'm sure apart from that, Dave, the scone sales will go high up in Devon next month. (laughs) (laughs) I think that they need to have some matcha green tea flavored scones. It's a natural. As for as for the landscape, landscape photography is something that I've always loved, and it totally escapes me how to do it. Listening to Gary today, yeah, I think I'm going to give it a shot. I think it could work. It was really helpful, at least for me. 
Thanks, everyone, for listening. Don't forget to check out the show notes in the description where you can find out more about our guest and some links we've prepared for them waiting for you. If you're new to the show, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We're in any of the major podcast listening apps, and maybe you can leave us a comment also. We'd really like to hear from you because it helps us a great deal to move this show forward. If you want to know more about us, check out our own links in the show notes as well and consider maybe buying us a coffee or two so we can get fresh photography content out to you each month. We'd like to leave you with a quote today on landscape photography from the great Ansel Adams. He said, a good photograph is knowing where to stand. Thank you so much for listening. Now get out there and make some photos. Bye.